Welcome to another Family Bible Study. Once again, we have this joy and privilege and really the wonder of it all that we can listen to what God has to say to us because the Bible is God's voice speaking to us and nothing is more important than that. And so as we uh, work on these scriptures, we trust that we will recognize whatever truth that we learn it is because God has given it to us. Okay, we've been looking at Jeremiah 50. Now, verse 20 goes on with this same beautiful setting. This is a, uh, a very unusual intrusion in Jeremiah 50 and 51 because basically these two chapters are dealing with judgment. Judgment. As, it, as we saw in verse 17, where God uh, took us back to the destruction of, of uh, Assyria. But now God is talking about the completion of his salvation. Verse 20, In those days, and at that time, this is the final time, the final time, the last day, the last hour, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. Now again, what Judah, what Israel is he talking about? The nation of Israel that lived 2,000 years ago over there in the land of Canaan? Of course not. He's talking about the Israel of God, the Judah that consists of all who have become true believers, the Judah that is the that uh, totally identify with anyone who has become saved, and and this and in Judah they shall not be found, for for and this is the basis. God makes sure we understand that the basis of our salvation is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not our work at a, in any sense. It is the work of the Lord Jesus. For I will pardon them. I will pardon them. On what basis can God just uh, decide? Well, I am God. And here's this dug, dirty, ugly sinner called Harold Camping, and he's... Uh, He's a miserable wretch in himself, and, uh, and uh, I, you know, I feel sorry for the poor fella. I'll just forgive him. I'll just forgive. After all, I'm king, am I not? I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. I'll just forgive him. Could God have done that? The answer is no, 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 no. Why not? Why not? Why couldn't he just pardon me or anybody else? Maybe you're... Uh, maybe you're a little more worthy of a pardon than I am, and, uh, and not quite as uh, 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 maybe a nicer person by nature than I am. And so, why can't he, God just pardon you? He can't do that. He just can't do that. Why not? Why not? Because the law of God demands that there be punishment for sin. The law of God demands punishment for sin. There has to be uh, integrity in, in the accomplishing of the law of God. If God would simply pardon me or anyone else because he felt sorry for me, then there would be an enormous violation of the justice of God because the law of God declares the wages of sin is death. And the death that God has in view is eternal damnation. So God just can't just decide, well, I, I, I feel sorry for that wretch. I'm just going to forgive him and make him my child. God can't do that. What did God have to do? God had to do something about all the dirty, ugly sins of that individual. 
they had to be paid for. So God looks around, looks around. Is there anybody out there that's holy enough and able to for, to stand in the place of this wretch that I want to forgive? Anybody. Can't find anybody. Nobody, nobody. So what was the decision? Well, I guess God himself will have to take the place of that person's sins. And so God named the Lord Jesus Christ. You're the one of the Godhead who has to bear the wrath of God on behalf of these ugly, rebellious sinners that I want to pardon. And so the sins of Harold Camping and uh, the sins of you put your name there and the sins of every and one that Christ planned to save were laid upon the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus had to be found guilty before God. And God had to pour out his wrath on him. And I never will understand this, maybe in eternity, but not here certainly, that punishment had to be equal to me spending an eternity in hell and you spending an eternity in hell and everyone who he came to save spending an eternity in hell. What an enormous punishment. And no wonder Christ is crying out, Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup might pass from me? We can never talk enough about this. It is such a, an awesome idea that Christ did this. And now, because he has paid for my sins and your sins, if you have become a believer, now he can justly pardon us. I forgive you. I forgive you. Your sins have all been paid for. Someone else has taken care of that. That is the Lord Jesus. And now you can be my child forevermore. And, and you, will, you will be mine forevermore. Never again will you be under the wrath of God. You are mine. You are mine. And I will feed you. And I will, I will take care of you. I have pardoned you. And that is the basis for this glorious statement. Now, one other phrase. I will pardon them whom I reserve, whom I reserve. Now, that's a curious word there, but you, it's a little more easily understood if we substitute the phrase, I will, I will pardon those who are left. Those who are left. You see, uh, the, the whole human race is divided into two parts. There are those who are under the, the judgment of God, who are under the kingdom of Satan, and they're, in, they're found in churches, they're found outside of churches, they're found wherever people are. And in addition, and, and they all are headed pell-mell for the judgment throne of the last day. They're going there uh, just as certain as ever, unless somewhere along they too would be included amongst those who are left or the remnant. The, uh, the, after all the unbelievers have been uh, assigned to hell, uh, are the, the, those who are left are the true believers. They who are spending eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the ones who have been pardoned. And, and throughout the Bible, when God talks about uh, his body of believers, he uses language like a remnant, like a, uh, a, a, a few. Uh, uh, like, for example, he says uh, there are many on the path to destruction, on the road to destruction, and there are few that are on the path to eternal life. It's always a few. The, the, that's why it is so exciting to read uh, uh, Revelation 7 verse 9 uh, it's one of the 
the unusual statements where it is saying in Revelation 7 verse 9, after this, that is after the season of the church age, I saw a great multitude which no man could number. That's one of the few places in the Bible where God really indicates that, yes, there's a great body of people still coming to the Lord Jesus Christ in our day. A great multitude. Now, even though they too are left, they too are finally just a remnant compared with the whole, uh, the whole uh, size of the, of the world itself. All right, let's go on to verse 21. Now, again, we have to leave this idyllic, this uh, beautiful place of contemplating the wonderful, glorious future of the true believers. And we have to get back into the serious, terrible lesson that judgment is coming upon the kingdom of Satan. On the last day, there will be judgment. Look at verse 21. Go up against the land of Merathium, against it and against the inhabitants of Pecod. Waste and utterly destroy after them, saith the Lord, and do according to all that I have commanded thee. Again, we have two words that we don't know anything about to speak of. It's uh, but, but, but they're curious words. The word merathaim uh, is actually a word that means double rebellion. Double rebellion. The word uh, mera is a word, a Hebrew word that means rebellion, and theim means it's a double rebellion. And so God is using, perhaps there was a city in Babylon by that name, perhaps there was, I, uh, theologians don't really know if there was, but certainly God is using these names to illustrate a spiritual principle. Those who are under the wrath of God are subject to those who are in double rebellion. You see, when we rebel against God, it is a serious rebellion. It is like a double rebellion. It is uh, there's no question at all, none whatsoever, that we are guilty. You know, sometimes a person is brought up for trial, and, uh, and there's evidence that he's guilty of this crime, but it's a little bit sketchy evidence, just a little bit. And it's hard to know whether, uh, yeah, he's guilty, there's no question, but just barely guilty, just barely guilty. On the other hand, if he had been caught murdering three people and, and had five witnesses of each murder, then we'd have to say, no, there's no question at all. He's guilty, guilty, guilty. He is, uh, he, uh, uh, there's plenty of witnesses. It's been a crime, it's a crime that's been repeated. And so he is obviously uh, subject to the penalty demanded for this kind of a crime. And that's the way God looks at those who stand at the judgment throne. They're guilty of double rebellion. As a matter of fact, they're going to be guilty of a whole lot of rebellion because how many sins is God going to know about at the judgment throne? How many sins? The books will be opened and they will be judged out of what is written there. And every idle word, every I, a sinful thought, every ugly deed will all be perfectly known to God. We will, those who stand there are going to be found guilty, 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 guilty a thousand times over. They are absolutely de deserve what the law of God demands, namely eternal damnation. Where it is, no one is going to stand there and just, and God is going to shake his head and say, well, yeah, there, there was a, an infraction in this person's life and, uh, 
And uh, But really, that's all I can find. That won't exist. That won't exist. Everyone that stands there is going to be guilty of thousands of sins. Some people worry, you know. They say, well, if I divorce my wife, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? Or uh, does that mean I can't ever become saved? As if that sin is going to make the difference. No, that sin is not going to make the difference. No single sin will make any difference. The fact is, we're either saved or lost. If we're lost, it means we have thousands of sins that will come against us. If we're saved, it means we have no sins that can be leveled against us because every, every sin has been taken by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then we get to the next word, against and against the inhabitants, inhabitants of Peacock. Peacock. Now, Peacock is a word that is sprinkled, uh, uh, its root word is sprinkled all through the Bible, and uh, it has uh, three or four meanings, but the two dominant meanings that, it, that uh, are in evidence in the word Peacock, no, the first word is numbered. Numbered. That has to do with uh, the army numbering the number of soldiers. And the second meaning that is also quite uh, 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 equally found, depending on the context, you have to look at the context, is the number, is the word punish. Punish. And both words uh, apply very directly to what God has in view. Those who are standing before the judgment throne will be numbered. That is, all of their sins will be numbered. Everything will be known. And they will be under the punishment of God. They will be numbered and they will be punished. They will fully express the meaning of the word peacock. And uh, this is the land that God is coming against. Go up against Mar Marathaim, those who are in double rebellion, and even against the inhabitants of Pecod, those who are numbered, uh, their sins are numbered, and they're under the punishment of God, or subject to the punishment of God. Uh, this, I believe, is the way we have to understand God's usage of these particular names in this, in this setting. All right, that's as far as we're going to get. Next time we're going to go on and, and, and with this lesson. And you know, it's not happy to talk about judgment today. It's not happy at all. If I had my druthers, I would never bring a lesson about judgment day. Because it is so sad. It is so ugly. But you know, when you're a Bible teacher, you have no, uh, you have no uh, right to make any decision. You have to teach what is there. What is there. And God has a whole lot to say about judgment. And as a matter of fact, we better listen when God talks about judgment. Because, first of all, unless we're saved, he's talking about me. If I'm not saved, and as God is talking about judgment, he's talking about me. And I better know what he's saying about me. I better know. I better not stick my head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich and hope that it's all going to go away. Because it's not going to go away, it's going to happen. He's talking about me. But the beautiful and wonderful thing is that it's at a time when God is still saving people. It is still the day of salvation. We can still cry out to God. We can still search the Bible, read the Bible, and and, and hope that maybe God will save me too. Oh, how wonderful all of this is. 
And so, if we hear about judgment and it frightens us and we begin to tremble in our soul, that's a good sign. That's a good sign because we have to tremble before God. We all should be trembling before God, even after we're saved, because it's only the mercy of God that we became saved. It's not because of any goodness on our part. And if it's still the day of salvation, it means maybe God will have mercy on me too. And as long as judgment day has not come, and as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep beseeching the Lord and begging the Lord and and pleading with the Lord, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I know I don't deserve this salvation. I know I don't deserve it at all. But, oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy. I know you're a merciful God, and maybe I, too, could be included. And we know that there is a great multitude, which no man can number, that are being saved. So why couldn't it maybe include me, too, if I understand I'm still not saved? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, O oh Father, we thank Thee that in this lesson we were able to get a little look, a little breather from judgment, to look at the wonderful future of those who are true believers. How wonderful Thou art. How wonderful Thou art. And now, Father, we pray for those, there may be those here right in this congregation today, those who are as we're teaching this, or those who will be listening to this later on, who are not saved. And, O oh, Father, we thank Thee that it's still the day of salvation. Wilt Thou have mercy? Wilt Thou have mercy on these who are crying out to Thee? O oh, Father, wilt Thou have mercy? And we praise Thee and thank Thee that Thou art a merciful God. Father, bless us now, then, in everything that we do today. May it bring praise and glory to Thee. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.